Yeah. Okay, so we are back for the lightning talks. We're going to have seven lightning talks because yesterday one was not there, so no, we're going to have it tonight. And about the rules. Each talk is going to last five minutes, sharp. At the end, you're going to hear the awesome gong played by the awesome Gennady and clap. So, first lightning talk, Criselda Rabino, AKA Chrissy, that is gonna talk about the HTG pancake request, <laughs> keeping your clients happy, not hangry. Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Chris Elder. I'm a software engineer at Deliveroo who was sponsoring this event uh, and I'm very proud to say that, so thank you very much, Yuriko. Um, when I'm not doing that, I'm a board member and volunteer at these two organizations called Women Hack for Nonprofits and Empower Hack, uh, the last one building tech solutions for refugees and they're both open source orgs. <laughs> yes, they're a great org. Um, you can read more about them, follow me on Twitter, Chrissy Go Round, um, if you're interested. So I've been working with Deliveroo for a mere three months, and in that time I've done a lot of things already. Uh, every day is different, which is so great. Um, and I've been doing a lot of stuff on APIs. Um, we're uh, working on APIs for the restaurant apps um, that we use for order management, and we're also moving away from a Rails monolith and into a service-based architecture and building our own internal event bus. Uh, so obviously the talk on Kafka yesterday was very timely and insightful, and I have a lot of things to say back to the team uh, when we get back to London. Um, I'm also really, uh, eating a lot of food. So <laughs> when you work for an on-demand food industry, uh, you end up needing to get a gym membership. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you today about API design and eating food. So specifically, I'm going to talk to you about brunch. And by that, I do mean the meal between breakfast and lunch, not brunch IO, the HTML5 build tool, just to clarify this. Um, and I've uh, created this makeshift graphic here, um, which will kill some of our designers if they looked at it, so I apologize if they do find this. Um, but just to set the scene um, while I tell you about my last brunch experience in London. So just um, to draw the picture, it was a sunny day. We have about five of those per year in London. And generally, it makes us all very happy. Uh, so we're in a good mood, and we tend to go off and want to eat eggs and bacon on sourdough toast for some reason and have brunch at a fancy cafe. So I went there with a couple of my friends and their baby. We had a big pram with us. And unfortunately, the restaurant manager wasn't in quite that good a mood as well. And the first thing we got from him was the fact that there was no room to sit. We were in the garden. Uh, we were very confused because there was obviously a, a table there for us to sit. And when we said we could move the pram, um, he basically spat out the same thing and said, sorry, there's no room here, walked away to the kitchen. And uh, needless to say, we went and had a really great brunch at the cafe next door instead. Uh, so the problem here wasn't the fact that there was no room to sit. It was the fact that to this day, we have no idea what the problem was. And it felt very much like this, like a generic 500 internal server error with a very useless error response. Um, and us as his clients felt very confused um, and frustrated because we didn't know what was going on and we vowed to never use that service ever again. So elusive errors, API design, they're not very good ideas. So what I would expect from the better brunch experience would be something a bit more like this. A little bit more thought put into the error response design here. HTTP comes jam-packed with its own status codes to use, not just to say whether or not a request was successful or a failure, but why. Uh, so try to use those, a general rule of API design. Um, and I think this guy could have uh, taken a leaf out of that book and been a bit more verbose with his error messaging um, just to help the client on the other end um, uh, solve their problem without being blocked by them. So moving away from that particular brunch experience, I also want to reflect on um, uh, brunches that I've had that I've really enjoyed. What was it about them that made them perfect dining experiences? Yes, the food was great, but it wasn't all about that. It was actually just the mere fact that they made me feel a bit special. They didn't make me feel like a generic client of theirs, um, and they put effort into their service to um, make it a bit more customized to my experience. It reminds me a lot about implementing HTTP caching in your API <laughs> in a very geeky way. 
Uh, so just to paint that picture as well, um, imagine I was at a restaurant for the first time and I was requesting a menu of theirs for the first time. Um, and they gave me a, a menu, put it on my lap, walked away. I ordered the potato pancakes, which were amazing, um, and made a few requests after that. Then the second time I came, uh, I get a waiter and I say, I changed my request a little bit. I say, do you still have the potato pancakes? And that's kind of like me saying, has your menu changed since I was last here? If it hasn't, then I don't need to see it. I just want those amazing pancakes of yours. I would expect a response much more like this at a Better Brunch Cafe, rather than them giving me the same menu all over again, because they say, possibly, I don't know, check the menu yourself. Um, I would expect a bit more better customer service, where they come and they give me a little bit more information than I asked for. Um, so in HTTP, that would be in the form of some additional caching headers in the response, uh, like this cache control header, last modified, and e tags. Um, and then that mere effort to give me a little bit more information would make me feel comfortable to ask all my annoying questions um, and cater for conditional requests. Um, like, OK, can you please give me the menu only if it hasn't changed, um, only uh, if it's different from the date I last saw it. And instead of giving me an entire menu back, they'll say, that cache door in your brain that remembers the menu uh, and the potato pancakes is correct, and you don't need to see the menu. So one second. So in Rails, this is a Ruby conference, so I just wanted to say that if you do API design, you will eventually see HTTP caching, and it's a whole universe to explore. I was very happy to see that in Rails, we can implement all these concepts in about three lines. Um, and this is what I love about working with Ruby and Rails, the fact that it does get out of your way to solve your problems, and you don't need to think about implementation so much. And there are three takeaways from this. So first, I stole it from Bill Gates, but your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. Second, build the type of service you would enjoy interacting with again, and this is not just about content, but how you deliver it, documentation, your error responses, those annoying things, prioritize them. And at the end of the day, leave your clients happy, not hangry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chrissy. So second round, decoding AFS key data, Commodore 64 edition by Stefan Daszek, correct? Right. Stefan, I'm a Ruby developer from Vienna, Austria, and besides doing high-level uh, programming in Ruby, I also really like to do some low-level stuff and play around with old hardware. Play around with old hardware like this. And recently I played around with this specific device. So who of you knows what this is? Hands up. Okay. I suspect these are the older ones in the audience. <laughs> For the younger ones, this is called a data set. And it's a storage device for home computers that was actually quite common back in the 80s because it was way cheaper than floppy disk drives. And you used it to save your data to audio cassette tapes, like this. And you could even buy tapes with pre-recorded data containing games, and applications, mostly games. <laughs> so if we take such a tape and with data on it and put it into our stereo, try to listen to it, what will it sound like? Well, so this was real data actually written by a Commodore 64 some weeks ago in my lab in Vienna. And it may have reminded you of the sounds you get from other devices back from the 80s. Analog modems, fax machines. So why do these devices all sound similar? If you want to encode bits and bytes into audio, you need to employ some kind of, um, some kind of modulation technique. And all of these devices, fax machines, modems, and the data sets use the same technique. It's called audio frequency shift keying, AFSK. So this is what this talk is about. 
And this is why all these devices sound so similar. So, AFSK gives us this. But how do we get back our data? How do we decode this back into bits and bytes? Well, let me show you. This is a short segment of the complete waveform and at a very high zoom level and it exactly represents one single byte. And to decode this byte, we have to look at individual pulses in the signal. So a pulse is a very short segment where the signal starts at zero, goes down to the bottom, up to the top, and again to zero. This is a pulse. And if you look closely, you might notice that there are several identical pulses in this segment. They all have the same length. And there's another group of pulses, also identical, but a bit longer than the first ones. And finally, a third group, only two pulses, which are even longer again. So, these pulses obviously come in three different lengths, long, medium, and short. And now, if we look at these pulses in pairs, we get various combinations like long, medium, or medium, short. And each combination has a specific meaning. Long, medium, for example, is start of byte. And it tells us that a byte is going to start. Medium, short is a one bit and short medium is a zero bit. So, hooray, we got some bits, we found some bits. Maybe we're done. Well, not quite. Two more things. First of all, I don't know if any one of you noticed, but in fact we got nine bits instead of only eight. And this is because there's one additional bit for error checking, a parity bit. So for now, let's just assume that the data is correct and we don't need this error checking, so just ignore it. And the second thing we have to do, the remaining eight bits are in reverse order. So the most significant bit, the bit with the highest value is coming last. And if we want to decode them back into a normal decimal value, we have to reverse them. So if we reverse those bits and have the most significant bit at the front, then we can simply do some math this gives us 145 as a decimal value, and that's it. We have successfully decoded a single byte of audio frequency shift keyed data written on an audio tape by an actual Commodore 64. I think that's success. So, being a Ruby programmer, I obviously also wrote a Ruby script that automates this process. Uh, it generates lots of interesting debugging output, also uses enumerators. Check it out on GitHub, and if you have any more questions, just ask. Thank you. That was so cool. And was like some, <laughs> some memories. Okay, third talk. Working with PDFs in Ruby if I rem by Thomas. If I remember correctly, we had some headaches with that, so let's see. Okay, so I will talk a little bit about PDFs in Ruby. And I will start off with a short warning. Um, if you know Slashdot, you probably know Slash advertisements. This is one. So bear with me. Uh, it is a shameless plug for one of my pet projects. But I think you might also find it useful. So what is the current situation regarding um, PDF in Ruby. You have Brawn, probably most of you know it or use it in Rails applications. Then you have uh, PDF Reader for reading PDFs. There's also a solution called Origami um, that is intended for auditing PDFs and combined PDF is uh, a tool for merging that came out, out for the frustration of Brawn not able to using templates and so on. And if you're using JRuby, you, you also have naturally access to many more libraries like PDF Box, it's, which is a quite uh, good solution. What are the current problems with the solutions that we have in Ruby? One is there's no complete integrated solution. You have no library that can read, write, and uh, modify PDFs. 
The other one is that uh, all of the current um, libraries only implement parts of the PDF specification. So one can read, the other can write, or they uh, don't uh, handle all the encryption techniques. And the last one is that uh, none of them have performance or memory efficiency in mind. So um, what, if, what if there was a library for reading and writing PDFs that handles most of the specification of PDF, can generate content like prompt, so you can generate pages and so on, uh, can easily be extended, so you can extend it with, uh, if there's a new specification of PDF, for example, you can easily extend it, and it is written in pure Ruby. There is actually one, it is not released yet, that's, that's the final catch, but there is one, it's called HexaPDF. It's one of my pet projects, like Cramdown. It uh, came out of the frustration with the current situation of PDFs in Ruby, and currently, the HexaPDF library can read, modify, and write PDFs. Uh, it is able to handle most password-based encryption formats, including the unreleased PDF 2.0 encryption format, and it has a bunch of other features. So it is fully tested. As you can see, um, the test suite has about, yeah, runs in two seconds. It's, it's rather fast, but that's okay. We want fast code. Um, Performance-wise, if you look at the, could I have the micro? Thanks. Uh, if you look at the, the first line here, you see that um, HexaPDF actually has the lowest memory usage in this uh, benchmark. Uh, this is because the file e.pdf is an encrypted file, and most libraries that read the files decrypt the content and then encrypt it again. Uh, in this case, where we just optimize the contents, uh, HexaPDF does something uh, better. It just decrypts the parts that need decryption and just uses the, the rest of the parts. Therefore, it has the lowest amount of uh, memory needed. Uh, if you compare it to a C solution like, like QPDF, uh, it still has my higher memory usage. Uh, this is a, a benchmark uh, regarding text output performance. Uh, it's taken from the Python Reboot Lab library. As you can see, the Braun is, is rather, um, it's only, only generates 35 pages per second. HexaPDF 249 pages per second. That's uh, rather good already. And, but Reboot Labs is uh, still a little bit better. But we can get to that point. Actually, uh, HexaPDF was at 210 pages uh, the day before yesterday after I put a fix in yesterday at the conference here. So what does it look like? Uh, this is an example for compression. You just open a document, execute the optimization task that's built in, and then you write out using the validation. Or you can uh, merge various PDFs. You create one PDF file at the top, and then you iterate through each uh, arguments that you have and append the pages to the output. Or you can generate the content, like you have a canvas on a page and you can draw images, ellipses, text, and so on. It looks like this. Uh, on the right, you see that uh, HexaPDF, HexaPDF can also handle TTF fonts and all the nice emojis there. Yeah, another one for text processing. Like this, you can find out the text positions. And the catch, I've already said it, so it's not released yet, but will be soon. Okay, next one. Using tech, like Rails, etc., to scale teaching effort online by Anton Dimitrov.
Okay, so while they fix the issue, we would like to uh, recycle the lanyards to give it to some other uh, conferences here locally and also because, um, well, they are not cheap. So it's good to help other conferences uh, reduce the costs so that we can have more fun. So at a certain point, you're going to find uh, three cardboard boxes at the, near the entrance. So you can just put it back there and that's it. Okay, we're gonna try later for this one because of technical issues, otherwise it wouldn't be a technical conference. So, Ruby for Science and Open Data by Viktor Shepelev. It's a bit dramatic, yes? Yeah, and uh, sorry, I need also my console. I, uh, I will show you some tricks, I think. Uh -huh. Sorry. Everything will be okay, I promise. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, I uh, I will talk of some topic uh, that requires some introduction of myself because. Uh, you may wonder why he talks about those things, uh, who, who he is. So I'll do exactly that. Uh, you, I think you can read the text. The most important parts is uh, that uh, I write Ruby like uh, for a long amount of years, and uh, uh, I love it, and uh, I mentor people, and I want Ruby to be great again, uh, or st to stay great. Okay, let's go away with those great again uh, things. Uh, the uh, only problem, uh, I am. it's my first talk in English and conference, so please don't kill me. Uh, okay, uh, I am talking, uh, I am working for TopTal, but I am not uh, um, talking for what I am doing for money. I am uh, talking about what, uh, what I am uh, volunteered to do and what, I, uh, what incites me and what uh, I want to incite you. Uh, so, uh, the topic is uh, let's use Ruby for data analysis, for data processing, for data uh, data visualization for some scientific things like uh, uh, some space calculations, for some visualization of some space things, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, you may ask why. Uh, like uh, we have our data analysts, they use one tools, we have our scientists, they use another tools, and uh, what, here, um, for, what here for us? We are uh, just uh, Rubyists, we do our, like, Ruby, uh, but I want to say that uh, currently in uh, like uh, we, we are 20, in 21st century and uh, science is everywhere. And uh, what, uh, what is important for us to do is uh, like uh, interact with uh, the bleeding, bleeding and cutting edge of uh, science and uh, implement it. That uh, 
tons of data is everywhere. I, I don't think I, I should say more. That uh, we are, at least we are not like some hickeys in our uh, caverns. We are programming smartphones which uh, interact with reality. We uh, constantly interact with reality. We have uh, tons of sensors and uh, other cool shit. And uh, um, what is important uh, for our work is this motto. Uh, what we do, what we ne need it for, is understand things and explain things, eventually to computers, mostly to people. And uh, if uh, we, uh, over everything else will be automated so, uh, sometime. So, uh, but uh, why we should do it in Ruby? Uh, first, because we love Ruby. Uh, second, because I think that uh, Ruby is really seriously expressive language that uh, seriously underestimated for like scientific experimenting and uh, that kind of stuff. We, we all know why, why it is so, but I think we uh, like we should fix it. I think we could, uh, at some point, we could do uh, something like uh, uh, what uh, DHH did when he invented Rails. Uh, everyone was happy with PHP, yeah? Uh, but then DHH came, came and he said, like, uh, Ruby and uh, its expressiveness uh, give me the uh, ability to do it another, in another manner. And we can do it in another manner. We can uh, like uh, uh, not catch the leaders like uh, Python or R or Scala, but we can uh, overperform them. And I'd I'd like to do it. Uh, that's the things we need to do. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll be quick. <laughs> Sorry, it, it was not very well planned. Uh, there are two uh, things that, that are cool about it in current Ruby. Uh, it's uh, like two of tens and tens and tens of things. Uh, is uh, SkyRuby organization. Uh, they are doing some uh, very cool stuff, but mostly catching with Python, with Python, Pandas, with R. But uh, some, some of the stif stuff that I uh, mentored this year, it's like, it was like uh, really interesting. It was like about space and so on. Uh, and uh, mm, another thing that I do myself and I wanted to present it, but I only 10 seconds have left. Uh, and I'll just uh, show you uh, something like I need like two more seconds. <laughs> yeah. It didn't work. Live coding is uh, hard. At, at, at least it was fun, right? Uh, so I just want you to see it in uh, internets, but uh, it was a bit screwed up, sorry. But I, I still think uh, that point about what, uh, what I've talked are uh, valid. That's it. You did awesome. Thank you. So let's try again with using tech to scale teaching effort online. Uh, <laughs> Apologies for the hiccup. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, two things I'm working on called Marathon and Hired in Tech. Um, my name is Anton. I'm based in Sofia right now and uh, I'm currently using Ruby and Rails working for a company called AirHelp. But in my free time, one of the things I'm working on is, are these two things. So um, let's start with Code Marathon. It's uh, an open source platform for online courses in computer science basically. 
Um, the most important things that you can do with it are that you can build courses, course content using Markdown. So this means that you can have lessons grouped in sections, you can have text, video, images, whatever Markdown allows you to do. And you can also define coding challenges for the students, which means that they can submit source code solutions for problems, for coding challenges, and then get instant feedback about how the solution did for a predefined set of tests. Some more things are that courses are like textbooks, meaning that a person can define a course and another person can create a classroom based on that course and then can teach students, observe what they do and stuff like that. Uh, very high overview about the architecture. It's split into two services. Um, on one side you have the platform, uh, which you know, stores course content, user accounts, challenges, and so on. And on the other side, so you have a grader. Both are Rails apps. Uh, and the grader is responsible for judging these source code solutions. Uh, it compiles the source code if needed, runs it, and runs it in a sandbox environment for which I'm using Docker. Borrowed some code from Val, who is one of our MCs here. You should check out his GitHub account. Uh, the platform talks to the grader when it sends the source code, gets back some status, pretty simple. All happens through an API that the grader exposes. So of course I have plenty of ideas for things to add, so like quizzes, some gamification for the students, more programming languages to be supported, and better security in some areas of the two apps, and many more things if there is time for that. So the code is split into repos in my GitHub account, publicly available. Uh, everyone can check it out. Um, so where is it used? Uh, currently I use it for something called Heart in Tech under you know, this domain, heartintech.com. It basically offers free preparation for tech interviews. So whoever is going to apply to a company, they should go usually through a tech interview. So it teaches them algorithms, system design questions, the usual stuff that you get in most places and some interview specific tips, because over the years I found out that even very skillful candidates could fail an interview due to not being prepared for the specific format of, of the interview. Um, so finally, some quick stats. Um, Heart in Tech used to be hosted using a CMS solution until recently, and for the last two years, more than 40,000 people studied for their interviews prepared in one way or another using the content. And just last Sunday, I switched from the CMS to Code Marathon, the platform that I just talked about for a while. And uh, since Sunday, we had like a thousand registered users trying the content, submitting solutions, uh, which motivates me to, to probably add the additional features that I have in my mind. So in summary, I um, just wanted to point out that uh, it's great that nowadays, using technologies like Rails, all the other stuff that I mentioned, and maybe something else, whatever you prefer, you can build with not that much effort, things that can have, uh, well, it's not a super big impact, but it's a significant impact on a big number of people who, who learn stuff from you, if you have that knowledge in your mind and want to pass it on. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. So, yesterday's talk was about opening a calculator. Let's open a calculator with Igor Omakov. I'm sorry for missing my talk yesterday. Uh, anyway, let's start. I want, I want to ask you to run some code on your Mac OS, if you have one. Uh, if you have an existing Rails 4.2 plus application, uh, please just uh, start a Rails server on the default port. And then visit the following address. Uh, there is nothing dangerous in this trick, uh, I promise. Please do it now, because it, it's going to take uh, like 60 seconds to start. We're going to switch to the next slide. So uh, let me explain how the DNS rebinding attack works. Domain name servers are like variables, and domain name is variable that stores IP address in it. 
And here we have a classic race condition because we can change uh, where the domain name points uh, when the page is already loaded. So this page is going to be loaded from um, my server, 52.17 and so on. But 60 seconds later, browser is going to refresh cache and uh, the same DNS rebinder is going to point to localhost. If you have a calculator by now, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, it's going to take 30 to 60 seconds, and probably that demo is down if many people visited it. Otherwise, you also can create a new application if you don't have a 4.2 version by now. It's going to look like this if nothing works. Uh, I tried it yesterday on seven different people and it worked. Basically, if you have a running development version of Rails on your laptop, uh, any web page can exploit your browser, can exploit your system and like uh, install malware, keylogger, seal your Bitcoin, leak your SSH keys and stuff like that. I think this is a big problem and that's why I submitted for a lightning talk yesterday. I didn't know how widespread the issue is until yesterday when I tried on, like, it worked, it worked seven out of seven times. Do you have a calculator, anybody? <laughs> Seriously, you didn't run the code? Okay. Uh, no, it's for all OS. Uh, the demo is just not perfect. And it also can, okay. It also supports web console better errors, it supports Python's workzook, and it leads to critical code execution. I mean, you're completely pwned. All your data is hacked, and it, it works for any browser, any OS, and any port, not just 3000. It will just take a little longer to enumerate your ports. I'm not gonna do that. It works not just for web apps, it works for Redis, Memcached, Elasticsearch, but uh, those ones are not so critical because we aren't going to get critical code execution with them. Um, and 60 seconds is very easy to carry out uh, with very little social engineering. Uh, the issue is known like for two years and uh, there were some public posts about it, but there were no fixes in core for a reason, because it's not REC, no Rails, no web console's fault. Because it's browser's fault and DNS design vulnerability it's like 50% on DNS and 50% on browsers. The bad news are they're not going to fix it anytime soon. That's why I, I want to ask you to shut down your Rails applications right now and implement this fix. The link is going to be on the next slide. The fix is very simple. We are going to check if the host we receive is in the whitelist. Whitelists are a good thing, like mass assignment and stuff. It's also very helpful for DNS rebinding. This approach is uh, state of the art in security. So for full write up, you can visit the blog and see some links and this, this snippet on the previous slide um, is also there. I, I really hope Rails Core will listen to this and probably implement some protections even though it's completely not related to Rails. It's just the way DNS works. And uh, I'm not going to blame anyone in this vulnerability but you guys uh, could be pwned for the last two years and all your SSH keys could be compromised. Like, even you, when you read some blog post online and you have running Rails in development or like some other web application that allows uh, REPL in the browser. This is the problem. Okay, I'm done. Okay, last lightning talk for today. Feel worse, do better. Non-technical talk about psychology, music, and software development by Alex Yaraus. Is this working? Hello. it doesn't work the first time. Uh, how do I switch it to the different screen?
Like this? Oh no. Okay. Uh, now. What do I need to do? Now do I need. It's annoying. Sorry about that. All right, hi, I'm Alex, and um, my talk is not so much a lightning talk at all. It's, um, it's more a, like a little piece of amateur stand-up comedy uh, in a format that um, vaguely resembles a lightning talk. Um, first off, I, I would like to ask the audience for permission to, to do seven minutes instead of five. Is that okay? Because my, the, the thing I have prepared doesn't really compress into five minutes at all. I would do it, but it, you, you miss out on all the fun at the end. Is seven minutes all right? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, off we go. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about a simple idea. Um, like all ideas, uh, it's um, not original. It's not mine. I stole it. Um, in a nutshell, it's this. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm done. Um, no, I still have some time. So um, let me elaborate. Uh, what, what do I mean by good thing? Frustration is a good thing. It's good in the sense that it can, be, uh, it can indicate that you're on your way to increasing creativity. And creativity um, is certainly a uh, desirable outcome when it comes to uh, software development. So um, it's actually, this version of the statement is a bit more word wordy, but more accurate. It's not frustration that uh, leads to creativity, but uh, there are some techniques like constraints and disruptions that cause increase an increase in creativity, but also lead to frustration. So you need to get past the frustration in order to reap those benefits. You need to get comfortable with feeling un uncomfortable. So let's talk first about constraints. One example is a code golf challenge, uh, like the one, just like the one hosted by a, uh, by a bank that shall remain anonymous because they don't endorse me. Um, the, the restriction they impose on, on the programmer the arbitrary restriction of using a f as, as, as little, as few characters as possible um, actually forces you to think outside of the proverbial box and thereby, thereby discover some nifty hacks and tricks along the way. Another um, well-known restriction is a time restriction, of course. I think we're all, we've all been there. That's exactly the kind of mood I was in when I was preparing this talk. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the idea is completely stolen from this awesome TED talk. I encourage everyone to watch it. Um, it is by, uh, by a guy called um, Tim Harford, um, <laughs> a London-based journalist. And he presents uh, two stories that are relevant to, um, to software development, among other things. The first story is about this uh, piece of uh, psychology research from the US. Um, there was an experiment conducted uh, on two groups of students. The group on the left is an, a homogeneous group. Um, they all know each other. They are all in the same sports club, whatever. They they know each other well. They um, and the other group is um, more diverse in the sense that there is a stranger there that that doesn't know the others. So um, they were both tasked with some um, with some game which involved creative problem solving. Um, by way of communicating and sharing information and collaborating, which is not unlike software development. And the result was that the heterogeneous group, or the group with a stranger, um, actually performed better, but felt worse. So they, um, in their self-assessment, they said, eh, we have doubts and we don't, we don't feel very confident about our results. The other guys were, ha were having a blast. They were really happy with their results, but they, but they actually measurably performed uh, significantly worse. So the takeaway from that into, um, into our regular day-to-day -day work is that maybe we should um, try and seek out that uncomfortable pairing partner, <laughs> that, that person that always, uh, asks, always um, questions your every assumption and uh, criticizes your every idea. Um, we might not like them, really. We might not like working with them, but, but we should be working with them because we might just achieve a better result, a more creative, a more... Um, uh, just high, higher quality code. And if you don't have a person that you don't like pairing with, hire one. Um, okay, the second story in this TED talk um, involves, um, uh, is about helpful disruptions. Uh, this person you see here is Brian Eno. Um, the Brits among you will know him. He's a musician and uh, composer and record producer who in the 70s, together with Peter Schmidt, um, 
came up with this uh, deck of uh, index cards designed to help musicians and bands to overcome creative block. So when they were really stuck in something, they, were, they just couldn't continue playing, couldn't continue writing their song, and they were just out of the flow. Uh, the idea was that they pick a card at random and just do whatever the card says. The cards are full of, um, full of nifty uh, aphorisms, very short ugh, haiku kind of things. And um, the idea is that it gets you out of, the, um, out of your process, it interrupts you, it inconveniences you deliberately, but that can help you um, get over the hurdle and get back into the flow. And funny enough, um, these things are completely applicable to any kind of uh, creative endeavor, including, and not limited to, software development. And I'm not kidding, these, um, the, the examples we're going to see, I call them um, developer edition, but there is no developer edition. This is verbatim from the musician's deck of cards, which you can find online and print them and use them. So um, some, of, some of these examples are, are painfully obvious, like take a break, get some fresh air, and then the solution will come to you when you're stuck. Some, are, some offer practical advice <laughs> or practical wisdom. Profound, doesn't it? Um, and uh, some offer a fresh point of view. It sounds almost like a Chinese proverb or something. Others sound just like Yoda got high on fortune cookies. And others are, um, appear to have been taken straight out of an agile handbook. It's, it's for musician, right? And it takes talk, talks about pairing, about pair programming, in session, essentially. So it's applicable to us as well. Um, some are motivational and inspirational <laughs> and encouraging, and others are highly unconventional, and yet others are very actionable. This is really easy to try, in fact. Um, if staring at your code for half an hour doesn't help at all, try disabling your syntax highlight and uh, change your code's, code editor's font to something ridiculous like, I don't know, Comic Sans? <laughs> so it will hurt you, it will hurt, but it might just help you shift your perspective slightly, just enough to get over, there, to get over the block and to look at, the, at your code from a different angle. Please, Gong, thank you. And um, if Comic Sans doesn't hurt enough, try Copper Plate. <laughs> That's it, thank you very much. Thank you so much, that was so fun. I'd love some feedback, thank you. Okay, guys, so... Well, it's time for a short break.